Um, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so like when you're looking at a catalog, um, yeah, like I said, so there, it's like it's it's straight like cash flow to to the potential investor, right? There's no expenses um, in that kind of like um, noise that you really have to worry about, right? Like you're you're getting these these royalties. So, I mean, looking at that, there's like when I'm evaluating it. So when we were at Royalty Exchange, and Joe might have talked a little bit about this, but um, if you heard of like Dollar Age, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what that is, it's just basically like, what's the, um, how old, uh, on average, how old are, are the er the earnings in the catalog? And th by that means, like, uh, so a, let me think of the best way to explain this. So like the, um, the older the earnings. So if the majority of the songs were released a while ago, those are going to have more weight on current earnings. They were released, say, last year, last month, it's going to have less weight, right? And that just really shows you, um, one, where in the life cycle is the is the catalog right and you know every song and catalog for that matter have this dramatic like curve right in the sense that you you, you hit the ground running really fast you make a ton of royalties but those are going to taper off say in roughly two yeah two or three years right so it's this like nice like bell shape like this bell shaped curve which goes up real fast and then it goes down and then it kind of tapers off right so knowing how old that the average song in the catalog or how old the average earnings are in the catalog tells you where it is in that curve. And then that helps inform your insight to, you know, are you going to expect a huge drop in earnings or are they more stable and, you know, likely to con continue kind of growing or, or remaining relatively um, flat or stable where they are. Um, so that's like, that would be say the main factor, right? That, that gives you your starting point and like with your forecasting and where to go from there. Um, and then like, then you want to look a little bit deeper, right? You want to know the sources of your earnings. And that's like, that's super important, right? Because if, if you're not really earning from streaming other, it, you know, in some special cases, there's some other sources that, that may be sustain, sustainable and really depends, but you really want those streaming earnings, right? Like everyone streams today. Um, you know, not a lot of people don't download music and, you know, it's, those are kind of dying formats, right? Whether you like it or not, but um, you want to make sure a decent amount of these earnings are made up of streaming. And I, I mean, the, the main factor, right? And if you're ever going to pay a premium for a catalog, those streaming earnings should be growing, right? Um, you want them to be growing kind of year over year. Uh, so, I mean, that's the second thing. And I, I kind of just say that. So it's, you're looking at the age, you're looking at the source or the format of those earnings. And then the third is just the kind of the overall growth and like what direction is it headed? Um, and whatnot. So, you know, are these growing? Are they staying flat? Like, how has it performed in the past? Um, and then, and then you, you can go a level deeper. So like, I like to look at that. And so coming from the financial world, right, I try to put put out of mind, the artists, the songs, you know, the popularity, that sort of thing at first, right? Like, I just want to get a baseline of the financials, right? The cash flows, right? I'm looking at this as an investor. Um, and so then your fourth would be to kind of bring those into the mix, right? Like who's the artist, what's that popularity, um, you know, that sort of thing, um, including things like how many, you know, platinum records have they have, um, how do, if they're gonna re release new records, like even though you might not own the royalties to those new records, but how do those impact the past records, that sort of thing. Um, so that's kind of how I look and analyze the, the royalty stream very high level there and, you know, in my forecast, I like to develop like a couple different um, outputs, right? So you have your you have your base case scenario, right? So this is like your your highest probability. This will how this is how how it will perform. You have your you know your pessimistic. So you know say it doesn't go as planned. This is how it'll perform, and then you have your optimistic scenario if it does better than your expectations, right? And then using those scenarios and those forecasts, you kind of come up with a a purchase price that you're comfortable you know buying the catalog for, whatever it may be. And then from, okay, so you had said that you might, then you would um, consider the artist from a brand mm -hmm. standpoint. So what's that mm -hmm. process like when you're incorporating that into the original evaluation? Yeah, yeah, certainly. So, um, you know, and that's a little bit more subjective, right? Like, because everyone, whether you like it or not, you have your opinions. Uh, you know, I, I probably like a different type of music than you might like or than Joe might like, right? Um, 
so and that's why it's good to keep kind of keep those out to the very to the very end right um but i mean i just like to look at like the popularity of stuff you know um there's like certain artists right that you hear on the radio over and over again and right even though the majority of those earnings aren't radio those are you know those are the 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 popular songs right those are people that are getting that exposure and whatnot right so it's more often for one of their songs to be a bigger hit than someone that you've never heard um although with that being said you know recently a, a lot of artists are they're taking control into their own hands which is great and like right they're releasing things on their own facebook page to their their own fans and whatnot um that sort of thing i also like to look at the audience size right so um you know, you get, you get like a hip hop artist, uh, like someone like Wiz Khalifa, something like that. Right. Like they, they have a nice wide reach and, you know, they can bring new fans into that atmosphere. They might not be as sticky, right. They might only be there for the, you know, the hit songs or um, the feel good songs. So, right. So that's one way to look at it. But then you also have your other, your other um, kind of lesser known artists, but they have that really niche base. Right. Um, and some of those are the best catalogs, right. You have this niche base, you have your fans that will, they're diehard fans. They're going to listen to you like no matter what, that sort of thing, right? It, all the new stuff you put out. So, you know, you want to look into that and see, you know, how that'll affect it, right? That that niche base is going to make the royalties very stable. Whereas um, someone like Wiz Khalifa or, or a hip hop artist that's kind of more mainstream, you're, you're going to have a little bit more bumpiness based on the songs that you're purchasing and whatnot. Um, and, you know, how, how that outreach is going and how they drop off and come into the to the atmosphere of that artist. So like, you, so basically what you're saying to summarize it for someone that doesn't understand, mm -hmm. it's like, it's more um, more turbulent or more, it fluctuates more for like an artist that might be more mainstream and not so mm -hmm. much of a niche audience, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. And, and that's not to say that that's a bad thing, right? Like right. the flux show, and that's where that base case scenario comes in, right? You're looking at that base case and, you know, and how you, you, you'd, you'd add those fluctuations kind of into your analysis. And again, it's not a bad thing, right? Um, but it's some of those fans are not as sticky in the sense that they're not going to listen to everything they put out, right? It might just be one hit song that they listen to or a couple hit songs. Um, but it's also, it's also, I mean, a great feature to have, right? Because you can't, you know, you get five people that listen to one of that hit song, two of them are like, hey, let me go back, listen to everything they have, that sort of thing, and right? And they can pull them into that atmosphere. Um, so it gives them kind of more, the it gives them the ability to to attract fans more to their music okay and i guess like what earlier we were talking about the different um streams how you were saying mm -hmm. streaming is yeah. like that's what's necessary and that mm -hmm. that's what will give it the highest evaluation basically so like mm -hmm. what are other um income what are other contributing factors to um, the evaluation besides like mm -hmm. just that streaming revenue. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, it, it, and you mean like format wise, like source wise? Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and that really depends, right? And you want to, you, you kind of want to look at things separately and then kind of mesh them all together, look at them the same, right? So if you have something, a super old catalog, say songs released 10 years ago, um, that's still getting radio play, right? Those are going to most likely that radio play is probably very stable in the sense that, you know, it's a 10 year old song. It's going to keep playing on those old these stations or, um, or whatever it may be, right? Country radio is a, a, good, um, a good example of that, right? Like you hear, if you listen to country radio, they have the new stuff, but you hear the same oldies all the time. Um, right. So those are going to be more stable if it's a newer kind of song say came out last year, or, you know, six months ago. Right. That radio play is only going to be there in most cases. Right. For a, six months to a year. Right. So you you're going to factor that in. Right. Like this radio play that I'm seeing, I'm going to expect this to drop down to almost nothing, if not, if not nothing. Um, so, you know, that's another factor. I mean, you look at your other ones, you know, your downloads, your 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 CD sales, those are, those are rough, right? Cause they're just in terminal decline. I mean, it's really hard to like when, when I model those out there, they're just terminal declines, right. Um, that you'd expect to see. And then, I mean, the other ones like sync, right? Like that one's, that one can be a bit, bit tricky as well. Right. Like that's hard. And it, again, it, that's where you're going to mix that with that brand, that caliber of your artist, right. Is this sync a one-off or, you know, is this, is this someone that's going to get a lot of these syncs? Um, and, and, you know, 
um, or maybe it's a song, right? Like the, we, you know, at Royalty Exchange, we'd get some of these songs that were, you hear that song and you're like, that's a syncable song in the sense that it's like, you know, you hear that song, you know, it's in ads, it's in TV shows, it's on Super Bowl commercials, that sort of thing, right? Um, so, you know, you got to kind of look at that as well um, when you're evaluating those earnings as to, to kind of come up with that. So that's kind of how I look at all the different sources. Um, again, like individually, and then you kind of mesh everything together to kind of come up with this overall uh, picture of, of where, you, where you are, where you have been, and where you're going into the future. So like how, how much more heavily weighted is age in comparison to the others mm. in like streaming revenue? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's a, I don't know if I have like a percentage weighting, but so I would weight age the, the most, right? Like that's the, that's the most, um, that, like I would give that the most weighting because again, that's really tells you where you are um, and whatnot. So, and it, it's really like, you know, the age, being where you are in the cycle is going to be your biggest factor of where you're going into the future. Um, so in that sense, you know, we're, we're looking at the age of the catalog and, you know, if you're an old catalog, you know, that, that age, you want that to be paired with streaming, right? Cause that's, what's going to keep you alive. You're, the radio in most cases, isn't going to keep you alive. Your sync's not going to really keep you alive, right? For your average artist, you need to be an older, you, from an investor perspective, right? You need to be an older catalog um, that has streaming is pretty steady or it's growing, you know, right there kind of with the industry. Um, you know, if you're a younger catalog, right? You, you want to look for the streaming, but you're, you're going to get those declines, right? Cause it's new, right? Everyone just started listening to your music. You're going to get those, you know, your, your non-core fan base is going to listen to it, but they're going to drop out of your atmosphere in, in most cases, right? And that song's earning is going to go down pretty significantly. And I think that's like the biggest challenge, right? In the, in the industry. And at least from my perspective and kind of my experiences, those newer songs are, are really hard to kind of model out. And um, it's really hard because, you know, in, you, you have an artist say, making like $50,000, you know, in the first six months of that. And it's, you know, it's hard to be like, Hey, um, a lot of these, like, whether you like it or not, a lot of these earnings are going to dry up, right. They're, they're not going to stay there. Um, so like coming up with a valuation that that's, you know, as an investor is going to provide me with a return that I'm acceptable with and also provide the artist with a, you know, a check or whatever, an amount of money that they're going to be acceptable with meshing the, like meeting those two goals is going to be the biggest challenge. Are you aware of the term, uh, evergreen catalogs? Yeah. Yeah. In the sense of like, um, have been around, will always be around that kind of, that kind of thing. Yeah. Can you kind of like elaborate on like, or explain what that is for mm -hmm. someone who doesn't know? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, an evergreen catalog is going to be, um, it's a catalog of songs that you like that well that everyone knows that that anyone um has if you hear it instantly you're like i know that song right it's it's one of those songs that it might be even in a genre of music that you don't listen to but every now and then you're like let me pull that up and listen to it right um and so those are those are going to be your most stable catalogs, right? Those are also gonna be your most syncable catalogs, right? And those are also going to demand the highest premium um, in the sense of someone trying to purchase those catalogs. And like, what would you say is your favorite part about doing um, evaluations or just about the industry at large? Yeah, um, well, so, okay. So, I mean, my favorite part about this is so this is a, a kind of a more finance area. So like I, I geek out about finance and like, it's what I do all day, every day. And I love that it's this new asset class, right? Like I, my days in Fidelity, say four or five years ago, no one, like I hadn't heard of music royalties or anything or, like that, right? Um, I couldn't even, I've probably seen one, but I couldn't even tell you, I've seen a headline about a music royalty catalog or something. And, and, and so, you know, coming to today, it's, it's like this huge, like, asset class and I have to attribute a lot of that to royalty exchange as like they they help develop this um, kind of this publicity around it and this asset class around it. And they, they essentially they're, um, you know, now you hear about it all the time. Like Joe texted me uh, yesterday, we were talking about Bob Dylan's catalog being sold. Right. And um, so I, that's the, my most exciting is that it's become an actual like um, investable asset class. And, 
um, you, you get like serious investors are now like considering it. Um, you have the, you know, hypnosis, right? They have that fun that that's all they do is to buy these catalogs, which is, is, is awesome, right? You have royalty exchange, which is like you buy catalogs off a of marketplace as an individual um, and transacting, you can sell them, right? It's, it's not like a perfectly liquid market, but it, it's a lot better than it, where it was, right? And you're really kind of bringing a lot of these, these things out of the shadows into like, into the light in the sense that there's a lot more spotlight on these artists and, and these deal, like these, you know, publishing and sound recording deals. Right. And I'd say there's a lot, which is great for the artists. There's a lot more pressure on the um, kind of the major players in the industry to be fair. And like, so, cause I remember when I first joined, they were telling me about some of these, like these deals and the fees. And I was like, this is crazy. Like I, so I come from finance where it's like, you know, you, you get some bad publicity there, but some of the fees I hear about that uh, or like the splits and stuff that they're being charged. I'm like, this is wild. So it was great to like, th that's probably my favorite part is um, I like that the artists are able to kind of really take more of a control um, of their, of their, their future. Right. And um, are you, are you familiar with like an advance? Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. So, and so I'd say that, I mean, this is another uh, huge aspect of it is like, what, right. These advanced deals were, I mean, I don't want to bash on anyone, but they, they were bad for the artists. Right. It's, yeah, yeah. you know, and it was like, you, you're selling all of your past royalties plus your future royalties. Right. And you had to meet these absurd thresholds or, or they're taking all of your income. And, you know, for an artist as it is, it's hard to live off you know, what you're getting, right, as a royalty. So right, 20 cents on a dollar. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. right? Um, so being able to something like royalty exchange should be like, hey, we're going to buy, we're going to match you with an investor, um, right? You own um, your copyright. Yeah, exactly. You're going to own the copyright. You're going to keep everything you make from there on out, right? So like, this is per this is a ch like a blank check to, to the artist to do whatever they want, whether that's make more music, to diversify, buy a house, you know? Um, get themselves out of debt, whatever it may be. So I, that's probably the the best part of the industry that I like. Um, and it, it, bringing the investor into it. So the great thing about what royalty exchange is that they, they're like opening this up to all of these different um, people, whether it's an individual investor, a major publisher, you know, a small publishing firm, right? So you're getting this competitive atmosphere that's not being done in a back room. So, you know, the artist is getting the best price, right? Like this is all of those, those thoughts and opinions and forecasts of what their, what their royalties might be collectively, they should be relatively accurate on what's going to happen. So you're going to get the best price and it's not just one entity or one person making a bid for the, for the catalog. Right. So it really, really helps the artists out in that way. What's one of the main differences between a fund like a hypnosis or mm -hmm. a publishing company acquiring catalogs what's, yeah. what's the different approaches there yeah yeah so um so the main difference is like one right something like hypnosis and i mean even hypnosis is is uh, i mean they're they're closer to a publishing company than an investor i'd say so okay so if you look at it this way right so an investor in, in an asset manager right or a fund um, that doesn't really have the music experiences. They're investing for for the returns, right? They 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 want to earn a rate of return on their investment, right? And that's really all they care about, in the sense, right? So they're not they're not experts. They're not um, music industry people. So they're they're really they're they're less concerned about that copyright, right? They um, you know they're they're less concerned about the actual. Um, underlying music in the sense of like, who is it and what kind of music they're publishing, um, that sort of thing. And they're just, you know, if the financials look good and they can get a, a good deal on it where, you know, the investor is going to get a, a decent amount of money or sorry, the seller is going to get a decent check. They're going to get a decent return on their investment, right? They're happy to happy to make that deal, but they're going to be way more passive, right? They're, they're not going to be involved in in anyone's life and you know they're not going to be involved in placing music in tv shows that sort of thing getting it on distribution platforms whereas like a publishing company um they have a lot more connections right and um they have a lot more involvement in the asset in, in that world in general right that's their expertise so they're able to you know leverage those connections and you know 
use them to, you know, play, get sync placement or publicity around it, um, that sort of thing. So they have a, a couple more uh, levers to pull, right? But, you know, as we know, there, a lot of it is, you know, you have this select group of elite artists that, you know, everyone's after and wants, you know, wants their catalog, wants to be able to place their, their assets, or sorry, their music um, and, and have it on there, say their, like, their docket of like music that they own, right? Um, whereas the average investor that has that niche fan group that isn't really mainstream in the sense that me and you may know about them, but they have a nice fan group, right? That's where the, the fund is, is great or that, that asset manager that's, you know, they don't care. They're like, the, the underlying financials look great. You know, we're gonna get our return that we expect. We, we don't care, right? So they're a lot more passive. So they, they kind of open up the, the, they open up that universe of who, who will sell their music and whatnot. Um, yeah, so no, that, that is very, that's a lot of, that's a good explanation of it. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. What are, you, what, do you, what are your projections as far as like the, just the sales and acquisitions space mm -hmm. in the future? What, what, do you, what do you expect to see happen? Yeah, well, so I would certainly expect this to grow, right? Like, um, and so the way I think about it is, so uh, again, coming from that financial background, right? The first thing you have to look at is all, what are your other alternatives as an investor, right? So like, let's not think about this just as a publishing company or, or, or a record label, right? But it's, what are your alternative as an investor? And um, not to get too finance, right? Like, you know, interest rates are record low. So if you wanna invest in bonds, you're not gonna get a good yield. Um, I mean, the stock market's, um, it's a great investment vehicle, but it's riskier, right? You're not getting these cash flows, you know, every day in most cases, right? Um, and I mean, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of other options, but it's essentially these, these low growth, like this low growth in economic environment, this low interest rate economic environment um, presents, pre presents this perfect opportunity for this asset, this, um, royalty asset class, which, um, you know, is high yielding in most cases, you know, anywhere. I, I mean, it really depends again, again, on what, on what the catalog is, but you're looking, you know, you, you can get yields in this 10, 15%, depending on what you're doing. Um, right. So it, it presents an alternative. Um, it's certainly, I'm not going to say it's not a risk or a riskless asset, but I, I would say, it provides no correlation to your other investments, right? So that's going to help de-risk what else the investor may have going on um, out there. Um, the other thing I love about it, it's going to give you cash flow right away um, in the sense that it's giving you these um, every quarter, every six months, every year, depending on the, the payout, most of them quarterly or, or semi-annually, right? You're getting this cash flow in. The main difference from that of a bond, right? A bond, you're getting these incremental cash flows every six months, and then you're getting that principal payment back at the end of it, you know, 10 years, 30 years, right? The, the difference with the, the royalty is one, there's no, like, there's no, like, there's no principal payment, say, demanded at the end of that, that term, right? Or whatever it may be, but you're getting these larger chunks of cash flow um, periodically through the life of the asset. Um, so I, I, I think that's, that's like great opportunity to, um, get your cash flow. I mean, w what I love about it is, again, someone like, so the way I thought about it when I first came is like, is I think about someone in retirement that lives off of their, their fixed income, right? Like you have these, these bonds that are, aren't really yielding you anything. And then you so have these royalty. Wait, I want to yeah, interrupt yeah. you. So it's similar, like you said, um, retirement in mm -hmm. retirement investment, it's similar to the idea of dividends, like a dividend stock, right? Yeah, well, so kind of, but I would say it's it's even better than that, right? Right. Um, in the sense that a dividend stock is when you own this 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 stock that can fluctuate in price, right? And, and like these royalty assets are going to fluctuate in price too, um, but they can also do away with that dividend um, if they want to, right? There's a board of directors they can say, you know what, we're done with that dividend, right? Um, which in most cases would cause a, t a stock to fall significantly. That's not the case with these royalties, right? As long as someone's listening to the music, you're getting paid. Um, so, it, and so like as a an investor in retirement, when you, you want diversified income streams, right? You want your bonds, you want your dividend stocks, or, you know, your other alternative investments. So, I mean, it's just a perfect fit to that kind of that portfolio. 
um, to say that helps you to get these cash flows. And again, they're, they're a lot more bulky. They're a lot more, you know, chunky, right? It's not just, you know, one, 2% um, of, you know, your, your principal that you have in, in this bond, right? These, these are going to be a lot more and they're going to fluctuate more. Let's be honest, like, they're not, they're not fixed by any means. Uh, right. But as long as you do your due diligence and people are listening to this music, like I said, you're getting paid. Oh, this was very, very dope. Very, very insightful. I learned a mm-hmm. lot just from this, you know, 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, of course. And, and I, I guess like another, so it, to get even, um, so, and I explained it to Joe like this, right? Like um, when you think about it, you can bar, right? So the whole, the whole like finance really comes down to a spread and sense. So uh, what you can borrow for and what you can take that money and invest it and earn for, right? So if you can borrow for 5% and invest at 7%, right? You're capturing that 2% in between. And, you know, it, like, again, the risk level is going to really determine what that is. Um, but that's what you're taking all day, right? And so that's why like if a fund these days, they can borrow at two, 3% and invest in something like this four or five, 10, 15%, right? So there, there's so much opportunity here as well. I, I mean, the main challenge though with the industry is really kind of unlocking the seller side, right? I think that these, the, seller, the artists, they have some reservations. And I would say, you know, when I started at Royalty Exchange to now, it certainly has um, changed dramatically, but I think there's so much more um, royalties to be unlocked that that can kind of flood the marketplace. And, and certainly, I, th- I mean, there's definitely the demand for assets like this. And that's why we're seeing these crazy premiums uh, right now, right? Um, so the significance, of, okay, so it's, this is not, this is only a thing more so just because the people that have been selling have been doing blockbuster mm-hmm. deals, but mm-hmm. it's not common amongst like lower level artists. So how, like respond to that. Yeah, well, and so I, I, I just think it's, yeah, you, I mean, you hear about these blockbuster deals and whatnot, right? That's what's going to get the publicity. But I, I just don't think that the lower level artists know that it's available to them or that this is an option or they, you know, like when you think that, so like your brain automatically, when you think of something that's complex and that can be complicated, it kind of shuts off and it's like, you know, I don't want to do this, right? This is going to, this is too much effort. Right. But it's in, in, all, in all honesty, it's really not right. You call someone up like royalty exchange, they'll, they'll help you out pretty quickly. And I mean, they get you paid very quickly after selling it. So I think it's this stigma behind it. Um, that's like, it's, you know, it's only for the, the high, those high profile artists. It's, it's complex and complicated to do, um, you know, that I need a financial manager or someone that's going to walk me through this. Right. I think those are all just misconceptions that, that, um, are blocking a, a big majority of these royalties from actually being sold, right? Um, it, you know, and I think the average invest or the average seller, um, you know, if there's I'm trying to think, like there's got to be a way to reach that average seller, right? To really unlock it, so like you have the, this flood of of royalties, you know, that these the buyers are there. They would love they love this stuff, right? They scoop this stuff up all the time, um, and. You, you need to be able to kind of connect those, right? So like right now there's so much demand, but there's not enough supply, right? And we, we need to correct those balances. Um, and how do you see that? Like, how do you see that happening? Like, Yeah, so I mean, I, I think like the, so and I would say that's the challenge, right? So I think like the high profile deals, they certainly help and they bring light to it. But again, it, it, it that gives more to that, um, misconception that it's only these high profile artists and it's how do we get these these lower level um not not lower level but these average artists right that that have that niche market which like i said earlier like those are some of the best assets out there right that niche market very stable at least um how do we get them to know that this is you know this is something that's available to them and not only that it's not a bad thing to do um when i first came into the industry it was there's i mean it was big that it was, there's was like a stigma, like you don't sell your music royalties. And if you do, you don't tell anyone, right? You don't talk about it. But I think that's a, that's a, a dangerous misconception. And you know, as my, my old CEO of Royalty Exchange used to say, he's like the, the right amount of cash to the, 
to someone at the right time can make a world of di- right it change it can change the trajectory of your life right and in the sense that if i mean if you're an up and coming artist you don't need to sell to a publisher or um a big record label right you go you sell to an investor you have this cash you make your own studio you start you know hire your own producer and you start recording your own music right without without that need um that help from those bigger record labels that are going to take 50% of your royalties if not more and you have this um you know with the digital platforms and whatnot it's easier now than ever to to get your music released right so it's you know what's going to put that artist in the best position to to succeed you know going forward and, and that's whatever it may be you know maybe maybe it's buy, even just buying a house is, is success to to some of these artists right and that's available now and it's just kind of getting the word out there um i i'm probably not the best person to to kind of accomplish that goal but i i think that's like the major challenge i know conan yeah <laughs> so what is it that you're working on right now what is it that you do in like so if like for someone that doesn't know you right now what would you like how would you introduce yourself to them yeah uh well it's, i mean so right now i'm just i i mean i come from a financial background so um i work on structured products it it i mean comp, they're more complex financial instruments essentially um and i value those and then i do work on some kind of royalty catalogs on the side when um you know i have a couple people ask me to kind of review stuff for them or or take a look at it like i said i i'm you know talking to a couple other people so i'm certainly still in that royalty space and i mean i love i love i mean i love the space i love the the niche asset um you know even when in my public investing i'm looking at the warner music groups that you know the ten cent music entertainment those so the hypnosis funds right to kind of see what's developing there so i mean i'd say I'll, i'm more of like a, a a financial explorer i like to so hold on you invest yeah. into catalogs yourself um so i don't have any right now um so so cuz when i was at royalty exchange we just want to want to avoid that conflict of interest so i've recently left royalty exchange um so i do i have my own analysis and i certainly will be purchasing some music catalogs of my own right um when when the right one comes across i'm a a bit more of a conservative investor so i like to um i like to wait back find the right opportunity and then pounce rather than you know just kind of firing off um but yeah certainly certainly will be purchasing some um and i mean uh royalty exchange is at the at the moment certainly the best place for that is is what i would say this is very very dope very dope do you have anything else that you would like want someone to know like can people reach out to you yeah certainly i mean i'm i'm available um all the time so like my email is r j o c o n n o r l i f e at gmail.com um and you can get me on on twitter just search ryan o'connor and you'll be able to find me or or look at your your friends um your mutual connections there you'll certainly see me there um and I, yeah i'm open to anything i like i said so i love finance when it comes down to it. it's what i do 95% of my day whether i'm working or or not working is finance related so i'll i'll answer any questions and you know anything that i can can help out with but i love talking about this stuff you know we could we could talk for hours for sure oh yeah oh yeah more than happy to <laughs> no this is that's perfect we got